Thanks everyone for joining um, the first Ballarat AgPAC um, Zoom meeting. So we're lucky enough to have um, Susie Sprague with us as a guest speaker. And Susie is a senior research scientist with the CSIRO based in Canberra. Um, and her main interests include canola disease management, and how crop management practices impact on the life cycle and evolution of plant diseases. Um, Susie has worked on various national GRDC, GRDC projects, including the uh, National Canola Pathology and Dual Purpose Cropping Projects. So without further ado, I'll um, mute myself and hand it over to Susie. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much to Michaela um, to, for inviting me along. Um, so she asked me to talk about black leg upper canopy infection, which I understand is has been uh, an issue and identified in your area and particularly this year um, across all of southern Australia is extremely topical. Um, so I guess today... I just wanted to talk about um, the different symptoms that we see with upper canopy black leg because it is quite variable. Talk about the risk, risk factors and then options for, for control strategies. Uh, so you would all be uh, fairly familiar with seeing early infection um, of blackleg on, on young crops. Uh, so I guess the primary symptoms that we've been dealing with in the past have been the early season leaf lesion infections. And it's these leaf lesion infections that lead to crown canker development, which you don't really see until you know, the start of flowering or even closer to maturity. So these are, I guess, a, an image of typical black leg uh, lesions. And these, these lesions on the leaves can appear right throughout, um, right throughout the development of the crop. And these are, re I think it's really important to identify and be sure about the types of lesions that you're seeing because these are a really key indicator um, as to the susceptibility of the variety that you're sowing to upper canopy blackleg. Um, so with upper canopy blackleg, it's not a different type of blackleg. Um, it's the, exactly the same pathogen and disease that we see that cause the leaf lesions that also cause upper canopy symptoms. So we know that blackleg can infect basically any part of the canola plant. Um, and I guess historically uh, we've been focused on crown canker because we've been sowing canola crops um, probably later than we are now. And so the crops growing during that uh, winter, sort of late autumn winter period where it's vegetative, exposed to lots of um, black leg inoculum as the season develops and the fungus matures on stubble, those spores are then released to infect the crop. But more recently, um, 2010 was probably the first year that we really saw uh, severe upper canopy black leg symptoms. And since then, um, we've come to understand a bit more about it, but it can be, can be really variable. So depending on what part of the plant it infects, um, the environmental conditions as well seem to alter uh, how those how those symptoms develop. So it can be really variable. So I've just got a few slides uh, with, some, with some different photos of symptoms that we regularly see. Just so you can get your eye in so that you know when you're out looking at your crop, whether it's, whether it's black leg, whether it's sclerotinia, or whether it's something else. And I just refer you to Steve Marcroft um, of Marcroft Brains Pathology, his website. And on there, he has a gallery of photos and there's some, 
some really good examples of different upper canopy black leg symptoms. So if you're wondering whether it's black leg or not black leg, um, you can jump on there and just have a bit of a look and scroll through some images. Or if not, um, if you're still not sure, um, feel free to flick me through um, some photos and I'll try to help you out. Can you see my mouse? If I move my mouse, yep. Um, so I understand that your crops are probably just um, at the stage where they're starting to pop up their first few flowers. Is that right, Michaela? Uh, almost. Almost, yep. Um, so, so at the start of flowering, what we would tend to see um, is, is some flower infection. Um, and infection of flowers can lead to more severe symptoms because the fungus can actually grow along that flower stem uh, to the branch and cause more, more damaging lesions. And sometimes we see this actually leads to the situation where those branches actually are weakened to the point where they'll just um, completely snap off. Also, we see inf infection of flowering heads, whole heads, um, which again are a significant contributor to, to yield loss because they're, they're reducing the potential of that crop to actually uh, set seed. Uh, we also see uh, the formation of these uh, lesions. Often they occur in the branch, um, the branch axles, uh, which tend to act like a cup and hold in any kind of moisture from either rainfall or dews. Um, and they keep that moisture there for quite a long period of time. And that, that environment just is really conducive to, to fungal infection and development. So we often see lesions start forming at these junctions, typical of blackleg. Um, the name suggests um, often the symptoms associated with it have a, have a really dark black discoloration. Um, and so that's one of the key things to help you identify whether you're looking at black leg or sclerotinia is these really dark um, margins and also the pepper, um, the pepper kind of dots um, that indicate that that's black leg as well. They're the, they're the fruiting bodies that form in those lesions. And in really wet years, um, we can also see progression of those symptoms occurring on, on maturing pods. So in 2016, we saw quite a lot of uh, late season pod infection where we had the season that just kept raining and kept raining. Um, and so in that case, uh, we often get uh, quite severe uh, lesions forming on, on the pods. So this is uh, an image that I took. So this is the same plant. This is the external symptoms that we were seeing uh, um, just before harvest. So the, the grower and the agro went into this crop um, to assess the crop for windrow timing um, and noticed a lot of plants with this uh, type of damage. So this was actually a grazed crop and it turns out it was probably grazed a little bit late. So after the plant was elongating um, and there had been quite a lot of damage to stems. And we know that any sort of physical damage to the plant, so whether that's from, from insects or from frost or from, from grazing animals, that really opens up the plant for black leg infection. So any kind of, any kind of damage, this season we're seeing a bit of uh, frost uh, splitting of the stems from frost damage. And so those symptoms, I mean, it's just like opening your garage door um, and allowing thieves to come into your house. Um, so just keep that in mind. So these, um, when we cut open this plant, what we can see inside is this really severe uh, discoloration. And even in parts of the plant that might look healthy, if you cut those open or break them open, often that blackening will extend quite a long way inside the plant, even though there's no external symptoms. And this has actually been a really tricky thing as pathologists, like we might kind of walk into a crop and say, oh, 
you know, those symptoms don't really look too bad. Um, but it's not until you open up the plant that you can see how far the fungus has actually extended within the plant. And so you can imagine the impact that um, that infection is having on the plant at a time when it's trying to, um, trying to fill, fill its yield potential and fill its grain. So we know the way that blackleg works, it really uh, interrupts the, the vascular functioning of the plant. Which is, which is inhibiting water and nutrient flow. Um, so in a severely infected plant like that, you can imagine that if, it's, if that infection is happening early, early in the season, so early during um, flowering when the plant is really setting its yield potential, um, what we're seeing is that that damage can result in fewer pods that the plant is actually setting it can also result in fewer seeds per pod and also smaller seeds. Um, so there's various, I guess, depending on the timing of infection, there's various ways that the fungus is reducing yield. Um, but overall, um, we are seeing that we can, you know, where we've had experiments, where we've tried to measure the impact of upper canopy infection, we're measuring up to, you know, 30 to 40 percent reductions in yield. So it can be can be very significant. Sorry, um, so just before you move on, with that um, percentage figure of upper canopy infection, does that translate through to a percentage of yield loss? We're just trying to work out those types of relationships. Um, so it is quite difficult because there's so many different parts that the fungus can infect. Um, you know, if we get 20% of flowers infected, what level of yield loss does that translate to? If we're getting a branch infected or a main stem or a pod infected. Um, so we've sort of got all these different plant parts that can be infected that sort of have different impacts on how the plant functions and how it develops yield. Um, and uh, so we're, I guess we're just sort of really at the early stages of, of the research to try to understand those things. Um, since 2016, the GRDC has had a um, significant investment in upper canopy black leg infection. Uh, so I think we're just, you know, as pathologists, we've, we've kind of been trying to grapple with what the symptoms look like, how we actually score the severity of them. Um, and we've also been grappling with the fact that they look different from season to season. We kind of get these different symptom types. Um, so I guess I'm going to tell you about the rules of thumb that we've kind of um, worked out are, are really the best management type scenarios that we can offer. But in terms of um, yield disease severity relationships, um, I think we've got, we've got a bit of a way to go there to understand what the, what the thresholds are. And would the, which type do you guys think so far would be the worst type of infection to impact yield? Um, is that question, mate? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'll just, I'll probably address that um, a bit more in a, in a couple of slides time about how to think about that. Um, so this photo is, a, is from one of my field trials uh, a couple of years ago. And the first photo on the left was taken when we went in to do our uh, yield cuts, our yield assessments. And this, is, this photo is actually of the same lesion. So on the 6th of November, I marked um, where the lesion extended to on this plant. And then nine days later, I came back and this is exactly the same lesion. So you can see uh, in those nine days around kind of the time that crops would be windrowed, um, how I guess the plant has responded to that infection. So we can see that there's this massive increase 
in the amount of disease that we can see on the outside of the plants and how it's affecting that plant around the time of maturity. Um, but that's, that is just an indicator of how far the fungus has actually extended within the plant, um, kind of hidden because we can't see those symptoms. And the other thing to note about these images is just the crops um, behind. So in, on the left image, you can see that all the branches, they're still quite green um, in this image. But then when you come back later, you can see that there's all these brown branches um, causing that crop to really senesce um, quite early. So in this crop, we measured um, kind of a 20% reduction in yield where we compared a crop that had no um, control measures to a crop where we um, applied fungicides multiple times throughout the season to try to completely protect um, the crop from infection. So it's not, an, it's not you know, spraying once to control it, spraying multiple times so that we can understand how much yield loss these symptoms are actually causing. Um, but I think if you're walking through your crop um, throughout the season, um, just looking for these symptoms, they might, they might appear small, um, but then really coming back um, at the time that you're windrowing um, is really when you can see a high level of expression of those disease and probably gives you a more um, accurate understanding of what your real level of, of disease load is, because that's when we see expression of those symptoms. And at that stage, Susie, does variety and um, like resistance ratings come into play at all or is that, that ship sort of sailed? Um, yeah, so we're, we're just really understanding around ge genetic resistance. So we know that uh, varieties that have uh, major gene resistance, so that's resistance that acts to actually stop blackleg getting into the plant. So they're varieties where you won't see any leaf lesions or very few leaf lesions. Um, so an example of a variety that has um, effective major gene resistance is Hyola 970, which is in group H. So in those crops, you will see very, very few leaf lesions. And so that means that those, those varieties um, have, have a good level of resistance to upper canopy blackleg. Um, but in varieties where you are seeing leaf lesions, then those varieties are going to be susceptible to upper canopy blackleg. Um, so really the blackleg rating isn't, isn't particularly useful for deciding which variety um, is resistant to upper canopy infection because the blackleg rating is an assessment of crown canker resistance. And so Australian cultivars have been selected for resistance to crown canker for a long period of time. But because we haven't had a focus on upper canopy infection, um, then we haven't yet developed varieties that have, um, have resistance towards that. Um, so as part of the GRDC project, we are assessing um, germplasm, like we're trying to develop a method that we can use to screen germplasm for upper canopy infection. Um, but the best way for growers to um, know whether their variety is susceptible is just to look for those um, early season leaf lesions. So this is uh, a picture of sclerotinia just as a comparison. Um, so we can see that the, the plants are really white compared to uh, where they're infected with blackleg, where they have that, those black margins. Sclerotinia, um, in contrast, is really, really white. And these black bits are the, the sclerotes that look uh, like mouse or rat poo and can be growing either on the outside or the inside of the plant. Um, so as we sort of um, were discussing before, Michaela, about the types of symptoms that are most likely to lead to yield loss, 
what we're finding is that um, crops that are flowering earlier are at higher risk of, I guess, being exposed in a window where the, where the disease has a long enough time to develop within the plant and have enough time um, to affect kind of the, the development and the physiology of the plant um, during grain formation. So for three years, we ran uh, trials across Southern New South Wales to quantify the level of yield loss that we were getting from upper canopy blackleg. And so, like I said before, we had an unsprayed treatment compared to a sprayed treatment. And the difference between those was the level of yield loss that we measured. And we had an inkling that earlier flowering crops were really at much higher risk of upper canopy infection. So we, we had crops that started to flower on different dates. Um, so we ran this, these same experiments for three years across multiple sites in southern New South Wales. So the red line is results from 2016, an extremely wet year. The blue line is from 2017, which was kind of a more average year, but had a really dry finish to the season. And then 2018 were um, extremely dry drought conditions. And um, the way I've represented this data is using um, the optimal start of flowering date. And I'm not sure if, if you're kind of comfortable with that, Michaela, or whether I should explain that just a little bit. Uh, but yeah, if you want to quickly touch on it, but um, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Susie. Okay. Um, so the optimal start of flowering date, um, CSIRO has conducted um, some research to look at, at different areas of Australia where canola is grown. What is the window, the optimal window for that crop to start flowering? So this is um, what we call the start of flowering is when 50% of plants have one or more open flowers. So it's, it's not very much yellow in your crop at that stage. Uh, and so this window is kind of identified by abiotic stresses. So it's looking at um, frost, uh, heat and water stress. And it's picking the window when um, yield, yield is maximised to avoid, um, you know, you don't want to flower too early because you're going to uh, get frosted a lot don't want to flower too late because you're going to run into heat and water stress. So it's kind of hitting that sweet spot of where you're achieving um, the maximum yield. So because we worked across multiple sites to combine that, that data, I've used the optimal start of flowering date for each site and then, then related yield loss to that. So overall, we can see that um, in seasons where we actually had disease. So in 2018, it was just so dry, we really didn't get any disease. But in 2016 and 2017, we can see that crops um, that were flowering earlier, and so the earliest flowering crops had the highest level of, of yield loss. Uh, in 2016, um, really crops flowering around this optimal time. So this is the, this zero line represents the middle of that window. Um, and so the start might be kind of 10 days earlier and the end of that window 10 days later. So in 2016, really didn't get much yield loss associated with upper canopy infection. But in 2017, we can see that crops that were flowering smack bang in that window we were getting a huge amount of yield loss, so 600 kilograms per hectare yield loss. Um, and that was in a season um, where, you know, we weren't measuring high levels of disease at all. Um, so this result was really surprising. And 
that's we've, we're really finding that the earlier flowering crops um, have this high exposure to conditions you know flowering in late winter kind of we're still getting those frequent rainfall events and infection events and the pathogen has time to develop within the plant to cause that yield loss so i guess um, one other question we had um, is why are we seeing this difference between 2016 and 2017 um, around how much yield loss we're getting from crops that are flowering at a similar time and our hypothesis was that the crops in 2017 as i said had this really quite stressful finish to the season so it was we hit some hot temperatures early on the plants were really sucking hard for any moisture that was left in the soil compared to 2016 where we had this really soft cool um, finish to the season and so plants really weren't moisture moisture stress we were seeing still very green plants um, with mature seeds that were really ready to, ready to harvest even though the rest of the plant hadn't senesced so our hypothesis was that um, under stressful conditions where the plant's really sucking hard for moisture that's when the fungus has the most effect on yield development because the plant just can't get enough moisture moisture to fill that those developing grains so in 2019 so last year uh, we had an experiment to look at this effect and we set up um, two crops that flowered on different dates so one on the 10th of July and then one on the 13th of August and we imposed um, two different water regimes so we had one that got irrigated um, during that crop uh, yield um, grain filling period so that it wasn't moisture stressed towards the end of um, end of grain filling during grain filling end of grain filling and then we had another treatment that didn't get any water. So we all know that last year for us was a very dry year. Um, so it was very moisture stressed. And again, we had the, the plus and minus um, fungicide regime. So what we found was that in the earliest flowering crop, um, where we didn't apply the irrigation, so where the crop was really stressed, we saw a significant yield difference between um, this unsprayed or nil treatment. So this was one that was exposed to upper canopy blackleaf. And then this was the one where disease was controlled. So we kind of confirmed our hypothesis that under, under stressful uh, conditions where we had, a, um, we didn't have a lot of, of disease again, because it was a dry year, um, but in this earliest flowering crop, where the fungus again had time to um, grow within the plant and affect that um, the ability of the plant to take up moisture and nutrients that's when we were really seeing those big uh, yield effects whereas in this later flowering crop we saw no difference between the sprayed and the unsprayed, unsprayed treatments um, either where we had irrigation or where we didn't have irrigation um, so the other, so in terms of um, control strategies, we've sort of talked about the genetic, genetic resistance and how to identify whether your cultivar has genetic resistance. Um, we've talked about flowering time and how that can affect um, disease severity. But the other control strategy is obviously fungicides, um, which is I guess probably the question that's on the tip of everybody's tongue. Um, do I or don't I? Um, so there's actually no products that are registered to control upper canopy blackleg. But the good news is that the fungicides that are registered for sclerotinia control are also effective for upper canopy blackleg. Um, so we know that, you know, 
the Aviator, Prasaro, they're both effective against upper canopy blackleg. Um, res our research to date has um, focused on applications at the 30% bloom stage, so targeting those same uh, timings that I, are used for sclerotinia. And we're seeing good results from those timings. Um, we don't always see results um, in terms of yield responses. And we think that is related to, again, the time that the fungus has um, to develop within the plant. So if, if the crop is flowering earlier and those sprays are going on to protect those earlier flowering crops, that's the sort of situation where you're most likely to see um, a yield response from those fungicide applications. Whereas if you're, if you're still targeting that 30% bloom, but in a crop that's starting to flower later, um, then it's those kind of situations where I think the, the yield response is, um, is less certain. And hence, um, one of the questions that Michaela was asking was, what is, the, what is the disease risk in winter canola types that tend to flower, flower later in the season? So I think the answer to that is that they're, they're less at risk of developing uh, severe upper canopy infection symptoms because they're flowering later. Um, they're kind of outside that main kind of winter, early spring um, conditions where you're getting multiple rain events, although this year might be might be different if predictions prove correct. Um, but I think traditionally um, we've seen that those varieties really don't suffer too much from upper canopy, upper canopy black leg um, infection. So just to just to wrap up, um, I think the key thing is to really identify and be sure of the symptoms that you're seeing and the cause um, so that you know how much disease is in your crop. Um, and it, it just helps you to know for, for subsequent seasons how much blackleg you're seeing in your crop, whether it is blackleg, whether it's sclerotinia. Um, earlier flowering crops are really the highest risk crops. Um, so if you're um, starting to flower right at the start of that optimal flowering window, then you're much more at risk of, of developing upper canopy symptoms that are going to then lead to a reduction in yield. Um, we talked about host resistance. So just, you know, being aware whether your crop has leaf lesions, get in and have a look down the bottom of the canopy um, and just check the number of leaf lesions that you're seeing. Uh, fungicide control, we talked about that. I would really encourage um, those who are going to put out sprays, leave, leave an area that you don't spray so that you can know if you're getting a, a yield response from that spray or not. And that's just going to provide you with additional information in subsequent years about um, types of seasons and risk factors that are going to give you a, a yield response from those fungicide applications. And just highlighting, um, I guess, any stress that the plant suffers. Um, so whether that's water stress, whether it's physical damage, they're all going to increase the impact of, of black leg in general and upper canopy in particular. Thanks, Michaela. No, thank you very much, Susie. Um, no, that was really great and informative. Um, I guess the tricky thing is um, uh, most of the, the canola grown in our area, we probably don't have that um, set optimal flowering window that's um, been done for Horsham or Wagga. So it's a little bit trickier for us. When Yeah, I was looking at the one from Hamilton. Yep. Um, so that's kind of opens early, a uh, late August, I think. Yep. For, for Hamilton. Yep. Um, oh, it gives us. So you might be a little around that, or a little bit a little later, later, even. 
yeah, a little bit yep. later than them generally, but um, no, it's yep. a good pace. So um, I just had another quick question, If we, maybe if we've just got a couple of minutes, um, just to touch on sclerotinia. Um, bit of an unknown for, for our part of the world, I guess. Um, just wondering what your thoughts were and just a super quick rundown on how it um, infects the plant through the, through the petals. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think sclerotinia is probably an interesting question for your area. Um, so sclerotinia, to be able to infect the plant, it needs a nutrient source. And so anything, um, any leaf material or petals that are dead and decaying will act as a nutrient source to then allow the fungus to infect the plant. So the, I guess the, the timing of early, that early flowering timing is to um, <coughs> firstly protect, um, like that sort of when you get the first petals falling off the flowers. So we know there's gonna be inoculum on those petals. And if then they're falling down into the canopy, putting a fungicide on that is then gonna protect that canopy um, from infection. But we, I mean, we also see very early season sclerotinia infection where the fungus is, is using senescing leaves that are caught up against the stem um, as, a, as a source of nutrition to infect the plant. Um, the other thing about sclerotinia is that it requires quite specific conditions to be able to infect. So it needs about 48 hours of continuous um, moisture in the canopy to be able to infect the plant. Um, so those conditions are, are probably not that infrequent uh, in your environment. Um, but in contrast, blackleg doesn't have that requirement. So it's able to infect with very little moisture um, around. Um, but the, I think the interesting thing for your environment in terms of sclerotinia is that what we're, um, what we're finding is that, I guess environments where we thought sclerotinia would just go mad, like you have, you know, continually wet canopies, um, and yet in those cold, really high rainfall environments, it doesn't seem to be such an issue. Um, where we've had trials around Hamilton. Um, for us, a similar environment is kind of Goulburn, about an hour from Canberra. We don't see high levels of sclerotinia infection. Um, even though I'm sure inoculum is flying around because scler sclerotinia has a really wide host range. So it basically infects any kind of broadleaf plant pasture species, weed species, cape weed, um, are all kind of hosts for sclerotinia. But again, just monitoring, you know, monitoring your crops, walking through, um, having a look is the best way to know what level of risk um, is in your environment. No, that's good. Thank you. Um, has there been any work done also with the use of uh, like copper fungicides or copper type products to combat sclerotinia or blackleg or um, yeah, any of those foliar diseases? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, it hasn't been a focus. I, I haven't done any work on that and I'm not aware of any work um, in Australia, but it's something that I can try to follow up on. Um, Apparently it's used in potatoes. <laughs> for sclerotinia control? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I think that's probably it. Uh, I'll do a final call for any other questions. If anyone wants to type any or text them through to myself or Jake. Um, but I think that's... Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Thanks, Susie. Yep. Short and sharp and very informative. <laughs> no, no problem. And 
yeah, as I said, if you if you see any symptoms that you're not one hundred percent sure about, um, feel free to send through an email or a, or a text message, and I can try to help you identify what it might be. No, perfect. Well, thank you very much, and um, yeah, really appreciate the the time you took. So, um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for coming.